Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check. Kaka. Okay. Kaka, kaka. Okay. Will you and mom still do that if we're across <clears throat> a large store from each other? Oh, really? Kaka, kaka. <laughs> tuki, 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 tuki. <laughs> okay. Okay. Presses on camera. I hope at least. I think he is. Yeah. You could look at that tail. You could. Look at that tail. House hippo. Uh huh. <clears throat> Happy as can be. Okay. All right. You want to read it for us? Yeah. Episode five. Mm hmm. We want to talk about Charles Eisenstein's essay, Misogyny and the Healing of the Masculine. So, this is an older essay of his. He published it in September of 2015. <clears throat> But I think super relevant to what we talk about on the podcast, and I'd be super curious your thoughts on how Charles presents the idea of the patriarchy and healing in men. Um, but it's everything that I appreciate about Charles Eisenstein and that it's honest but still kind. Mm -hmm. It is breaking the mold of how we view society and us versus them and these age old ingrained patterns and envisioning the world in an actually more healthy, productive way. Okay. So I'm excited. And when he wrote this he lived in Asheville, which is yeah, really neat. I, so, I just noticed that. Yeah. Like, What's that? Oh shit. Yeah, yeah. He so, doesn't He doesn't live here anymore now. Oh. I wonder yeah. why I moved out. Uh you could probably guess. <laughs> All right. Charles Eisenstein, misogyny and the healing of the masculine. My new home of West Asheville is in the news. A local coffee shop, Waking Life Espresso, closed its doors after its owners, Jared Rutledge and Jacob Owens, were outed for hosting a misogynistic blog. In addition to repulsive and degrading comments about women and details of their supposed sexual exploits, they boasted of one or two incidents that may have crossed the line into rape. As one would expect, the community exploded with outrage. Ample coatings of tar and feathers were applied to the two men, and many people think they will have to leave town. I wonder, though, if there might be a better outcome. After all, their attitudes are an extreme version of a malady that afflicts many men, maybe the majority in our society. Who among us, my brothers, has never used getting laid as a way to boost our self-esteem? I know I have. In fact, there was a time in my life when that was my primary motivation. While I didn't publicly rate my partners or say degrading things about them, I felt uncomfortable to be seen in public with them if they didn't conform to cultural standards of attractiveness and proud if they did. To some extent, I bought into using women as a kind of social currency. I also used sex and the affection of a female as a way to assuage my insecurities and salve my wound of self-rejection. In other words, I think the actions of Jared and Jacob are on a continuum with my own attitudes and actions, which makes me hesitant to join the public stoning that seems to be <clears throat> underway. The outcome I'd like to see is healing, both of two men and of the women and larger community that they harmed. Many of the commenters on the blog that exposed them thought that they were sorry only because they got caught, but perhaps they unconsciously wanted to get caught. The unconscious shadow rises into our awareness for a reason, to be faced and to be healed. Here is misogyny, previously underground, made visible to the community. The community can accept this opportunity for healing, or it can simply banish the men and pretend the problem has gone away. Personally, I would like to see something like a Truth and Reconciliation Committee arise out of this incident. I'd like to see the men be confronted by those they harmed and really hear what it was like for those women, their families, and their community to be humiliated. Getting caught brings regret, but only fully feeling one's impact on another brings remorse, and from remorse, the possibility of healing arises. Society is becoming aware of the damage that patriarchy has visited upon women, from economic oppression to domestic violence, sex tra trafficking, rape, and genital mutilation. But patriarchy also damages men. Many of us have grown up in a toxic cultural story of what it is to be a man. When women are turned into objects and sex is made artificially scarce, all things become scarce when subject to property thinking, then of course men will be insecure. 
As with money, they will attempt to gain a semblance of security through control of scarce resources. They will feel a compulsion to dominate, because in a world of scarcity, only the dominant experience abundance. The life of man in patriarchy is a life of endless anxiety. Being a loser is never far away. Now you might say that this psychological suffering pales in comparison to the physical violence perpetrated on women. But consider, how much must a man be hurting to violate and abuse the precious gift of the feminine? Mm -hmm. Tragically, the dominating, controlling, and abuses behavior enacted by insecure, patriarchy-damaged men doesn't meet their real needs. They are diverting their need for intimacy onto sex and their need for unconditional acceptance onto control. Therefore, no matter how much they get laid and no matter how many women they dominate, it is never enough. They will need always to up the dose to push the degradation of women to new levels and still it isn't enough. Men like Jared and Jacob are symptoms of a much deeper malady. Shaming and punishing them addresses the symptom. Can we also address the illness that the symptom points to? Part of that, I believe, is to transition into a new cultural narrative that defines what it is to be manly. If the old narrative was about domination, control, and emotional shutdown, what would be an alternative? I would like to see men like Jared and Jacob be held in a circle of men that offer a story of the sacred masculine and a post-patriarchal world. In that world, a man does not dominate and abuse the feminine, but seeks to protect her, treasure her, pleasure her, be unshakable for her, make her laugh, bring gifts to her, and, as in a ballroom dance, sense where she wants to go and invite her there with clarity and confidence. He places his qualities of linearity, decisiveness, humor, calmness, solidity, directness, strength, persistence, generosity, mobility, and assertiveness in service to the dance. I offer this as a partial description of what a sacred masculinity might be, living to varying degrees within men and women both. How would men like Jared and Jacob act if they were immersed in a male culture that upheld that vision of masculinity? It is hard to say, since we don't yet have such a culture. However, I know that many men are striving to create it, gathering in men's groups to hold each other accountable to the values I have named. They are not impressed by stories of sexual conquest. They are not impressed by weakness masquerading as strength. They are not impressed by insecurity expressed as dominance. They would say, man up. Am I hoping for too much if I envision these two men landing in a circle of brothers to ground them in a new story of manhood? While a time of rage is normal, perhaps even healthy, in time it passes and we naturally turn toward a desire to make the fabric of community whole again. That transition is difficult in a culture of othering that takes certain people and assigns them to be the category of evil. Any apology is interpreted as insincere. Any attempt to make amends is interpreted as self-serving. The next step in the culture of othering, after the miscreant has been securely identified as a monster or a scumbag, is to de degrade, humiliate, and punish that person. Step one, dehumanize. Step two, punish. Can you see how this recipe, recipe precisely mirrors the misogyny and abuse perpetrated by the two men? Can you see the same insecurity at play when we assure ourselves, I am better than that person. If I were in the totality of his circumstances, I would have chosen differently because I am just better. Let whoever be without sin cast the first stone. Hmm. Some readers will doubtless think that I am suggesting that Jared and Jacob's behavior go unpunished. Certainly, in the logic of punishment, they deserve to be punished. In that logic, my suggestion for an alternative process, truth and reconciliation, restorative justice, etc., can only be categorized as excusing or tolerating their behavior. What I'm suggesting is a step outside the whole mindset of deterrence and punishment, which, by the way, is the logic of the entire prison industrial complex and much of U.S. foreign policy. That mindset only makes sense if the terrorists, the criminals, the extremists, 
along with men like Jared and Jacob, are irredeemable psychopaths who will only listen to the language of force. In a world of us versus them, punishment is the only way. Is that our vision for a more beautiful world? To purge it of evil people so that only the pure remain? Is that our vision of a better human being to purge ourselves of sin? It won't work. In neither case does the evil disappear. It just goes underground and pops out in a different form somewhere else, and the war on evil never ceases. Do we want to send these two men out of town, regretful but not remorseful, bearing even more self-hatred than they had already, perhaps to act it out a bit more discreetly in another place? Instead, we can cultivate a community that moves past the old story of judgment and punishment, that is open to the redemption of errors, and that believes in its members' capacity to heal and grow. In such a community, we can stop hiding our hurting parts, our unacceptable or ugly parts. We know we are accepted at our core. When confronted with harm we have done, we feel safe to move through shame and experience remorse, knowing that forgiveness lies on the other side. As an imperfect human being myself, that's where I want to live. Isn't that the kind of community you want to live into? It's really good. Right? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Gosh, everything he writes, I'm just floored by. Can I give you a hug? Yeah. Thank you for reading. Sure. <clears throat> Do you have thoughts that you would like to share first? I think you should go first. Man, there was a lot in that. I know. There's so much to unpack. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, where to even start? About halfway through, I was like, oh, shit, I should be taking notes. Oh. Um, okay, so off the top of my head, okay. a couple themes that I picked up, I think. Uh, redemption mm-hmm. is one theme I'd like to touch on. Um. There's some elements in there that for that were making me think of um, the importance of free speech. Mm-hmm. Um, what were some of the others? Uh, yeah, the 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 group, the yeah. brotherhood of men yeah. to hold hold others. I mean, he, he wasn't even talking about. I mean, he was talking about accountability, but but beyond that, mm-hmm. almost like a. Um, you know how we've talked about men holding space for other men to mm-hmm. hold men in a more um, authentically masculine way. Mm-hmm. Um, man, I feel like there was something else too that the the sense of talking about retribution of these men and not and just running them out of town. <laughs> Um, the, when he was talking about <clears throat> the part of a, where where it was talking about, isn't that the same type of insecurity, the same type mm, of, yeah. where was that? I can find it. Yeah. Here. Yeah. The, the othering, yep. the, the theme of othering and then dehumanizing, mm-hmm. uh, and then humiliating and punishing. And can you see how this recipe precisely mirrors the misogyny and abuse perpetrated by these two men can you see the same insecurity at play um when we assure ourselves i'm better than that person um Mm -hmm. yeah 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 and that's a huge theme in all of his work is this us versus them this othering Mm -hmm. this narrative of separation that we have cultivated Mm -hmm. that there's always a good and you are always good and there's always an evil and there's someone someone else how that's not serving us at the end of the day. And I, sorry, keep going. Yeah, he really came out with this during the COVID pandemic. This was 2015, wasn't it? Yeah, but like he really came out with this like othering. Oh, okay. That's when that philosophy is, of yeah. his, I think, became more popular. Talking about how we can say that people who 
didn't get the vaccine are evil people and they are others and right. must be banished and yeah. all of this same punishment narrative. So, yeah. This really, I feel like this helped me connect um, words to why I get so frustrated and annoyed um, at mansplaining and toxic masculinity mm. because that's what it, that's all it feels like it's doing is othering there and there's no mm. pathway to redemption mm -hmm. there and it's it's pathologizing an entire sex mm -hmm. um to me it's akin to you know woman logic or female hysteria mm -hmm. you know um and yeah that's that's kind of what you know, I mean, I think I even said something very similar to that, that the, the term mansplaining, all I hear, all I see when a woman uses the term mansplaining is their own insecurities mm -hmm. coming out, you know, being offended just at the fact that someone of the opposite sex is explaining something, even if they're doing it in an intellectually arrogant way or, you know, they're explaining something that, you know, the person already knows. But that's that very much is what that made me feel like or, mm -hmm. or what that reminded me of. And I think in sort of speaking about redemption, I mean, I think there's there's so much of that that we, I mean, when you talk about like critical race theory and this idea that like America is, you know, born out of the original sin of racism and slavery and that, you know, just being, a, you know, white in America automatically makes you racist or all of these sort of ridiculous ideas, they're, they offer no path to redemption. They, they basically say you're pathological and you always will be, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and so I, I so greatly appreciate what he's saying of like, yes, let's let's hold this type of behavior to account. But at the same time, like we also have to have a path to redemption right. or we'll just run these people out of town and they'll just go somewhere else and do the same thing. And that's what I don't <laughs> think people want to look in the face. Well, because this I cancel culture just puts your head in the sand. It just mm -hmm. acts like the problem doesn't exist, but it doesn't solve it. He's right. the only one that's brave enough to say if we don't give these men another path, they're just going to keep doing it. And I think the thing is, when you have this here where it says, you know, we other because I, I'm assuring myself basically that I'm better than this person. I would have chosen under the same circumstances differently because I am just better. To, to someone like myself who, who tries to hold myself to account, what I see there is, is, is just a, a person in judgment who just lacks the ability to judge themselves mm -hmm. and so that that's why they offer no pathway to redemption because then they would also have to recognize that they themselves need to walk that path right and when they don't want to then they make sure everybody else knows that that they're irredeemable and it makes them feel like there you know there's no need for them to also be redeemed exactly and so of course like he says let he who is without sin cast the first stone mm -hmm. i really love what he said at the beginning talking about women as sexual objects and mm. getting laid as a way to up your social status or make yourself feel better. And yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think that's something that so many young men go through and I know I did. I mean, I don't remember specifically what it was for me that changed, that helped me see the way that I viewed women. And it wasn't even, it's not, the thing is, it's not even like it's a choice. I don't think, really any young man is making a conscious choice to view women as sexual objects. But hopefully, if you have some discernment and self-awareness, you realize at some point, oh, every time I see an attractive woman, all I think about is, is sex, is like, you know, the pleasure that her body would bring me. And then you eventually realize, like, yeah, that's, that's incredibly pathological, you mm -hmm. know? And I think maybe when I realized that was when I realized how destructive it was to me as a young man to be promiscuous. And so that's when I talk about how damaging promiscuity is for women. I make sure to say that I also believe it's incredibly damaging for men, too. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, I think, you know, when you when you realize the destruction you cause to yourself by being promiscuous as a man... I think it's very easy to then see, well, it's it's just as, if not more destructive to all the women who I've, you know, sexualized. And and now, of course, we have, you know, uh, a culture that wants women to sexualize themselves. And a lot of women do sexualize themselves and 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 even more so think it's virtuous that somehow it's empowering to be promiscuous. Um, 
Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I guess that's, you know, that's sort of getting off topic of this specifically, but. Yeah, I'm curious. I mean, he shared, obviously, his experience. Yeah. And I think set a really great example of saying, I think the actions of Jared and Jacob are on a continuum with my mm-hmm. own attitudes and actions. Mm-hmm. I think that's an important piece to point out that people don't want to see parts of themselves they don't like. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot easier to other this other person and label them as bad, just as you said before, than having to look at that part of themselves. Mm -hmm. But I think I'm curious because he's sharing his experience, you're sharing your experience. Like, what is that that it is so common for young men to fall into this trap? And how are we not serving our boys and raising our boys in a way that could help them with that? Well, I feel like this is an answer people are tired of hearing, but it's an answer that that we need to hear over and over and over again until we fix it. But fathers, better fathers, fathers in homes. Mm-hmm. Um, that that only feels like a partial solution. You know, maybe if maybe if we had more fathers in homes, that would be because these fathers are are better, stronger men who. I mean, but then I, I'm trying to feel like I have some concept of why there's less fathers in homes, and I feel like that's such a, you know, in a, in a society that's so hostile to men right now. I mean, on the one hand, I understand why men are struggling so much, and but, you know, as one of them that wants to try to fix it, it doesn't feel acceptable to me to say that, you know, as men, we can check out because society is hostile to us. Mm-hmm. Um, that seems secondary to the fact that we still have a duty when it comes to to our families. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't know. It's complicated. I don't, oh, yeah, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know that I have an answer. And that's okay. I'm sure there's a lot of things that play into it. I don't think it's an easy, straightforward answer. I mean, I, you yeah. know, okay, so... I think we certainly could say that, like, I mean, I th- okay, let's start maybe at a foundation of consumerism. Mm-hmm. Okay, sec- the idea that sex sells, mm-hmm. which it certainly does. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's no mystery that, you know, as, as young boys growing up seeing what's on TV, how females are portrayed on TV, how the female body is is used to generate revenue. You get used to seeing it and you, you know, I mean, hell, you have, you know, if you do have a father in the home, he's sitting there in the recliner watching TV and a, you know, Hardy's commercial comes on with a good looking woman eating a burger and he's like, oh yeah. And then you're there as a kid and you're like, oh, well. Hell yeah, you know, like mm-hmm. you don't know. Um, I mean, and it's just it's it's part of the DNA. Like it, it really like our biology meshes up with the culture, and I mean, it's the culture recognizing what triggers the biology, oh, for sure. you know. Yeah. Um, and so, really, it just feels like you're kind of helpless. Like you're just lost in this, like you know, milieu of. A consumerist culture that's leveraged, you know, sex to to sell shit, and and that just gets it just permeates, it gets in there, yeah. um, and it takes a lot of effort to like pry those those things apart For within sure. yourself. Yeah. Um, but how how to really reach the young, you know, the young boys, the young men the middle-aged men, even the old ones that are still, you know, just as immature and, and ignorant, um, you know, as they were with teenagers. I mean, I don't, I don't know. We talk a lot about how a lot of new age spiritual values are actually Christian values from in disguise, yeah. <laughs> which I get because there has been significant harm caused by organized religion and sure. churches on an individual mm-hmm. level. But mm-hmm. One of the Christian values that we talk a lot about is the ability to refrain, to not give in to hedonism, Mm self-control, I think, 
something that we're not taught in our society nowadays where mm-hmm. everything is easy and everything is available to you yeah and people make money on you being impulsive yeah and following your whims yeah, well said. and desires mm-hmm. so i think that has something to do with it as well what are you saying there's not enough restraint mm-hmm. we're not teaching young boys or anyone restraint do you think it's that we need to treat teach restraint or do we need to teach why restraint is important? Oh, that one. Mm-hmm. The value of it. Yeah. If you just say, hey, you don't get to do what you want to do, any, Naturally you any kid do is going to rebel. Of course. You know? Yeah. And most but adults if, will say. Yeah. If you understand the why behind mm-hmm. it, why this is a value, if it's a value in your family and you see other people being role models that are exhibiting behavior. And of, benefiting from this it. value. Yeah. 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 You remember that documentary that you watched, um, The Mask We Live In, about young men and yeah. their problems in society? Mm-hmm. The filmmakers, before they made that film, they made one called Misrepresentation mm-hmm. that is all about this. It's mm-hmm. about how women's bodies portrayed in media, how that's tied into consumerism, and mm-hmm. we should watch that one too. Okay, yeah. we should. Mm-hmm. I was, uh, so the episode of Joe Rogan that I was listening to the other day. I can't remember the name of the guest that he was talking to. Um, Michael Esther, I think. Yeah. Michael, Michael Easter Mm. health and uh, health and fitness writer, a professor. They were talking about, uh, Oh, they were just talking about, the human condition, taking care of the human body, how to, Mm. I mean, a lot of this, how to restrain, how to restrain, how to show restraint, how to have Mm -hmm. discipline and the things which you can implement into your life. They were talked about addiction a lot. And there was one part where they were talking about, you know, addiction being this impulsive behavior that satisfies in the short term yet is detrimental in the long term. And then he was saying, you know, they were talking about how like, Oh, if you can, if you can point that towards productive things, he gave, uh, Michael Easter gave the example of him being a writer. He's he was an alcoholic, and he's been sober for eight years or nine years. And he said, "Yeah, and I feel like I just I took all that same energy, and now I just impulsively write." Mm. He's like, "But that has Im- improved my life." Right. Um, and then Job was basically saying he, he was like, "You know, he's like, why isn't there just one like manual, like something for like how to like." navigate or operate this complex machinery like us the the body that sort of thing and like the there's why isn't there just like a one you know thing that can tell us like the things to do to get through life to like be more productive to be better people this and that and i was like the bible <laughs> maybe, the bible maybe <laughs> And i feel like for context i should say like i i used to be a militant atheist and I totally thought the Bible was just, you know, a load of dumb stories written by people, you know, thousands of years ago that had no idea about anything. And, I, you know, over the last three, few couple years, as I, you know, learned to embrace suffering and learn to embrace patience and learn to embrace discipline and, and other values like, like honesty and integrity and being reliable and, and, you know, my, you know, trying my best to stick to my word and not agree to things that I don't want to do and, and just trying to show up better in the world. I've noticed how much my life has improved in those two years, how many things I've been able to do that I never thought I'd be able to do. And um, just, you know, even though I, I still feel that I fall short of my own expectations in so many ways, but I'm so much more than what I used to be. Mm. And now, in, in just the recent past as I've started reading the Bible, I'm seeing all of these behaviors, which I just sort of, I don't know how, I mean, it all started with running, which just called to me somehow. I mean, mm-hmm. if that wasn't God, I don't know what is. <laughs> um, you know, slow, boring, and painful was the reason I hated running. Then it was the reason I loved it. And it's pretty much the thing that's helped me, like, at least get on the path of becoming who I want to be. But now that I've started to read the Bible, I'm seeing all these things in the Bible reflect all these experience, all these experiences that I've had. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, 
interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like thousands of years ago, they had a basic understanding of this really complicated machinery and how it goes wrong if we let ourselves just be hedonistic lizard brains, mm -hmm. you know, and how our societies crumble mm -hmm. when, you know, we just give in to impulse and, and sin and incompetence and how they flourish when we show some restraint, when we hold ourselves to a higher standard, when we point to something larger than just ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, Joe, you're not going to hear this, but read the Bible. That's the book you're wanting, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Um, I was really curious about your thoughts on this, and you can say pass because we could easily I'm not pass. we could easily do a whole episode on this. <clears throat> is why I would say you would pass. Okay. Where he said, patriarchy also damaged men. I know your thoughts on the word patriarchy, and you think it's kind of not even a realistic idea. So I was curious in this context. Because the argument that he proceeds to make after that is that men aren't being served by our society either. And it's sure. no wonder that they do the things that they do. I mean, what does he say? How much must a man be hurting to violate and abuse the precious gift of the mm -hmm. feminine? Mm -hmm. Instead of looking at these men as evil perpetrators, it's having some compassion and empathy to say, what were they not getting that they needed? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I just don't... I haven't heard... A definition of patriarchy that seems to make any sense like I don't know what it means you know I would love to have Charles Eisenstein write a an essay or I just love to hear his explanation of what it is because I, I haven't seen an explanation of, of it that makes sense to me I mean the closest thing I've heard is is your explanation of it which basically just says it's it's a society that values all of these sort of masculine traits mm -hmm. and, and and favors those traits and but i would say i don't i don't even know that our society i wouldn't even i in through my eyes i don't think that's our society i think we have a portion of our society i think success in our society values ma the masculine traits but i also think that nature success in nature prioritizes masculine traits you know, so if you want to go out, if you want to go out and I mean, if you're a caveman and you need to kill a saber toothed tiger or a mammoth to eat or protect your family, like that's masculine energy that's required to do that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so to but me, if we're talking about the true biology of humans and what nature favors, the point, according to biology and evolution of existence, is to con continue the species, to continue yeah. your genetics, to continue your genes. Right. To do that, I would think there'd be an equal argument to making sure that your kids survive and mm -hmm. your kids reproduce. Yeah. You know, which is a very more feminine thing in some ways. Sure. You know. Right. Well, yeah. And of course, you know that I believe that that we are supposed to be a balance of masculine and feminine. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think the other thing I don't I I would like to know about when people use the word patriarchy is does that suggest that our our patriarchal society benefits men uh, disproportionately than it benefits women because I would argue that in our current American society it, our society benefits women and favors women much more than it does men so I, what does it mean it does it mean that it benefits men. Because our society is is not favorable to men right now, so that to me doesn't seem apparent. Is it? Does it suggest that it's just a, a handful of the the point zero one percent of the most psychopathic, narcissistic men at the very very top, like the 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 one percent elite that gets talked about when in like the sort of the governmental control you know conversations? Mm -hmm. Is it those men who are sort of you know through social coercion manipulating the way societies operate and and so are we saying because it's it's you know a group of men at the very very top of the world that it's a patriarchal society like i just don't i don't have a good mm. concept of what people mean when they say that and i think what frustrates me is i think most people that use the word patriarchal patriarchy also don't know what they're talking about they also don't know what it means it's just a buzzword that they've heard that all of their friends agree with that the culture agree with agrees with and it gets you social currency to say it and so they say it 
Mm-hmm. So I just want to know what it means. We should let people tell us their definitions yeah. of patriarchy. Yeah, we can get a, a whole bunch of different definitions. Yeah. <laughs> but Start from there. So yeah, I mean that's that's kind of why when I hear it, I just roll my eyes because half the time I'm like, you don't you don't know what it means. Mm-hmm. You're just saying it. You know, mm-hmm. I would love to hear Charles Eisenstein's thoughts on it because I would obviously know that he's thought it through and would have you know, things to, to put behind it to support it. You right. Know? And he says something that's not popular, that it also doesn't benefit men. Sure. You know, because I know. think the common narrative is a patriarchal society gives men a lot of privilege mm-hmm. and men have it easier and right. all of this. But And that's where I'm just like, all right, next. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, there's something that you said in that that reminded me of a conversation we had <clears throat> I don't know if you call it a conversation. I was on a run and my mind was working and I left you a bunch of voice notes. (laughs) Breathily, (laughs) like... (sighs) (sighs) You're talking about the 1% of men and what does that look like? And People talk a lot about toxic masculinity and that's tied in with the patriarchal theme. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that healthy masculinity Mm -hmm. is not bravado or boisterous. Mm -hmm. It's quiet and humble. Yeah. It does what it needs to do, yeah. but it's not going to need to tell you about it. Right. You know? So what do you hear about? Do you hear about the seven customers that had a great experience at a restaurant? Or do you hear about the one person that was like, oh my God, I found a hair in my food. Yeah. So there's this social effect of it's easier to remember negative things, which evolutionary evolutionarily makes sense in our brains. Mm-hmm. We need to remember the things that are threats. We need to remember the things that can hurt us. Mm-hmm. We need to remember to do differently. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily keep us alive better to remember the positive things. Sure. So our old brains haven't caught up. I get that. Yeah. And yeah, folks that we would describe as toxic masculinity that are driving these big fancy cars and have all the outfits and are walking around with all the ladies and doing mm-hmm. all these just boisterous in your face things probably from a place of deep insecurity mm-hmm. those are the ones that we see right you know those sure. are the ones that are getting in a fight in a public place or yelling and screaming or telling women things that are degrading and ridiculous and catcalling sure. them on the street you know yeah you're going to handle your business and no one's going to know about it except the dude that you were having to handle your business with sure so I think that contributes as well. There's kind of, we're not getting the full picture. Yeah. We're not seeing clearly. Well, the interesting thing is, is that I've seen, sto- you you just described, you know, you just described healthy masculinity, which, you know, I have my own thoughts on, on the, the language we use around masculinity. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to believe that masculinity is inherently healthy. Right. And so there's no need to call an unhealthy man toxically masculine his his lack of masculinity as toxic masculinity he's just he just doesn't get to be called he's just masculine. not masculine yeah. you know like if you're yeah. a big jacked man but you're insecure on the inside and abusive towards women you're not a masculine man mm-hmm. and on the same the same you know in the same sense you look at someone like jordan peterson he's not physically imposing I view him as a masculine man, mm-hmm. right? He's he's intellectually imposing, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, so, but regardless, you know, you mentioned, you know, emotional control and like reservedness and that sort of thing. So, like stoicism, um, there's a lot of a lot of people that try to say sto- stoicism is toxic masculinity. Mm. That like if you're if you're a man who, you know doesn't express his emotions that you're yeah that you're that's toxic masculinity i think it's a fine line i don't think we can impose femininity on masculinity thank you yeah i don't think we can expect men to experience and process and feel their emotions in the same way that women do because that's a unique gift to us Mm -hmm. to exist in this watery emotional world Mm -hmm. And it's a gift we can bring to the masculine mm-hmm. to share with him, but sure. we shouldn't expect him to operate in the same way. And you know, yeah. And here's what I would offer about stoicism: stoicism comes about when you're so in touch with your emotions that you don't have to put them out into yes. the world. It's a from a non-reactive exactly. Place. It's it's 
is I'm experiencing anger right now, but I'm aware of what's going on in the environment to make me experience anger. Anger. I'm experienced mm-hmm. enough in myself to know why and that I'm experiencing anger. I'm also experienced enough to know that if I just do some breathing and mm-hmm. be mindful that I can conduct myself and compose myself in this situation right? and still have constructive outcomes. It doesn't mean that a stoic man is not feeling emotion or that he's repressing him. A truly stoic masculine man is so in touch with his emotions that there's no need to make others in his environment responsible for those emotions. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This isn't a perfect one-to-one correlation, but I think it's interesting to talk about just because it happened this morning. Mm -hmm. So for context, I know that there is a potentially challenging and frictive conversation that I need to have with a friend. Frictive. Is that a word? I don't know. (laughs) It is now. Frictionive. Yeah, yeah. No, I like it. (laughs) I knew what you were saying. I think it's a thing. Um, Frick. (laughs) <laughs> sorry <Yes. laughs> I just know that it's going to be challenging for me because it's going to put me up against the edge of my stuff it's going to be yeah a growth edge for me for sure so we were talking about it this morning and I I mean I wasn't overly emotional but I was feeling frustrated and a little bit of dread and a little bit of confusion and muckiness and like maybe even a little bit of anxiety surrounding it. And so you, what you did so beautifully is you just held this space. You held this container where I felt so safe to express everything that I was feeling and everything that I was thinking, even if it wasn't completely coherent or put together or made sense yet. I felt like you weren't judging me, that you were there, you were super present. You were engaged, you were listening, you were that strong, supportive, safe container. You held it super, super well. If I were to be talking about this conversation with a female friend of mine, that wouldn't be the case. She would probably be so highly empathetic and open that she'd start feeling the same emotions that Mm. I was feeling. But I didn't expect Mm. that from you. I felt incredibly supported in the way that you showed up Mm -hmm. and it didn't mean that you had to get all emotional sure but you i still felt like you really knew what i was feeling and understood it so i i don't know if that would be considered stoicism or not but i feel like maybe there are women that would yeah maybe there are women that say oh well my man doesn't listen to me or he doesn't understand or i just get all emotional and he doesn't know how to make sense of it and i feel like the highest expression of masculinity is just being able to hold the space for the emotions of the feminine. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit different than talking about your emotional experience, but I think it's related because it's talking about how the masculine and feminine interface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that that reminds me sort of the conversation we were having over text not too long ago where I think we were maybe talking about (laughs) jujitsu. We're always maybe talking about jujitsu nowadays. (laughs) But I basically relayed this sentiment that, you know, that we were, I think we must have been talking about the balance of masculine and feminine with it, when it, within each person. I don't know if we were specifically talking about that, but I basically conveyed this, this sort of desire in myself that, you know, one of the things I love about you, but also that like I want in a, in a partner, in like a wife and in a mother to my child, like children, is that. <clears throat> I want I want to create, you know, extend my masculine frame and protection in a way that allows you to embody it when you need to. Mm-hmm. And the analogy that I kind of use, and I'm going somewhere other than beyond this, but the analogy that I used was, you know, it's like like obviously with jiu-jitsu, I would like you to be able to defend yourself if you ever needed to. But also I said something to the effect of like, you know, if it ever if if you you know if the situation ever arise, I want my wife, the mother of my children, to fight like a violent savage to protect those children if she has to, mm-hmm. you know? And so that, you know, that to me is the the desire of the type of masculine that I want in a woman. But that's not what I want her to lead with. And I think in a man, like what I envision for myself and the ideal man is 
Like for myself, yes, I want to be big and physically imposing. I want to know how to fight. But I also want to be the type of strong, like physically imposing man who also can be as soft and as feminine with with my children mm. as you would be, as the mother would be. And mm. while you're going to be in that that frame more than I will, and I'll be in my masculine frame more than you'll be in yours, it's being able to switch into that mode, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, I, I think, um, you know, earlier this morning, that was basically all I was trying to do is not be as feminine as potentially one of your friends would and, uh, and feel all your emotions and become reactive myself, but just to be as soft as I could in that moment while maintaining, you know, that frame for us to, to have that moment in. Mm -hmm. Well, you did great. Thanks. And I appreciate it very much. <laughs> and yeah. And you legitimately swept me at jujitsu last Monday. So good, good on you. True story. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What else? What did you think of his definition of, masculinity he calls it sacred masculinity first yeah. off what do you think about that wording it's interesting it's interesting yeah. i mean we hear the word sacred feminine a lot but we don't sure. hear sacred masculine that's true yeah you remember you ever see the emperor's new groove it's been a really long time you remember uh i think his name's pacha or pancha the the llama no that's cusco oh his his like the the peasant that he's who's who his is really huge massive man and he oh, has a yeah, tiny little wife yeah, and, yeah, and a little yeah, boy yeah. and a girl yeah and so Cusco wants to put his new palace right on top of this hill where Pacha or Pancha's house is um then of course he gets turned into a llama and then him and Pancha go on this big adventure together mm -hmm. but I I think of Pancha for some reason because he is literally like a hulking massive man but he's like so calm and gentle with his family and with his kids but you know, when it's like time to turn up, he also does that too. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, as far as sacred masculinity, I don't know. I don't know if we need to put all of these adjectives in front of it. Mm -hmm. Like masculinity and femininity, they're just, they are, and they're pure, and they they come from, from God, and and anything that deviates from them is, is, is a deviation. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know. I just I think the the adjectives that we put in front of masculine in front of feminine I yeah. don't know. They all just seem subjective mm -hmm. like subjective adjectives. And so I don't know if I have necessarily an opinion. I I think yeah. maybe those are just things that make us feel like I don't know, like we're saying something. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's reasonable. Oh man, the circle of brotherhood. Mhm. Mm what did that bring up for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it also, you know, it was, what was it talking about? It was... What if we would have invited these two men that we wanted to outcast from society instead of pushing them out, we called them in, you know? Or, yeah, I mean, I don't know enough about them. Or do they take responsibility, true responsibility for for who they were then? Do they have a desire to change? Would they be receptive to... To masculine men saying, you know, this is a stage of your life that is going to be beneficial to you and everyone around you to grow out of. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, like I say, with with men and women alike, we do need more better examples. Mm -hmm. Not more better examples, but an increased number of quantity positive, <laughs> and quality. Yes, quality and quantity. Um, we need more mentors and role models. Um, I just, man, it just, our culture feels so hard. It feels like a current that's so hard to fight against right now. Mm -hmm. It can sometimes feel, feel a little bit despairing. Mm -hmm. I hear that. Yeah. But that's why we're here doing this. Mm -hmm. That's why we keep doing the good work and not giving up on it. Mm -hmm. It's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't hate to say it. Nietzsche said, God is dead and we killed him. <laughs> and I, 
just see that as being so evident. And God doesn't have to mean big G God of the Christian Bible or Allah or Yahweh or, you know, any, any of the others, but we're just a culture of such shallow independence, hedonism and self-service. And I think we got to find a way out of that. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that, you know, I mean, I don't, I believe in God, but I don't call myself a Christian, but I don't know that I don't, I don't know the path out. You know, I mean, what do you think about what he says? How would men like Jared and Jacob act if they were immersed in a male culture that upheld that vision of masculinity? It is hard to say since we don't yet have such a culture. Yeah. However, I know that many men are striving to create it, gathering in men's groups to hold each other accountable to the values I have named. They're not impressed by stories of sexual conquest. They're not impressed by weakness masquerading as strength. Mm-hmm. They're not impressed by insecurity expressed as dominance. They would say, man up. Maybe this. We got to get people off the internet. Yeah. I mean, maybe just maybe just one objective thing to strive for is just getting people off of social media. Mm-hmm. And and connected to commun- their communities. True. You know? Real life connection. Re- yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I mean, you know, you know, I, I, I look at people like Joe Rogan and Lex Friedman and Andrew Huberman and, and I'm like, yeah, I think they're all good examples to follow, but they're not real. I don't get to interact with any of those, those types of men. And I don't have any of those types of men in my life. So I feel like I'm looking at this distant star thinking, mm-hmm. ah, it's something to point to, but it'd sure be nice to have a battle buddy, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So how do we find... How do we let men cultivate these connections in their own communities? These men, men's groups that he's talking about, these circles of circles of brothers, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think one way culturally is we could stop letting it be so acceptable to shit on men all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I'm in my, you know, my counseling classes and we talk about being sensitive to multiculturalism and the experiences of, of you know, the, the different genders and, diff, you know, the different gender identities <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and races and experiences. But as soon as you, as soon as you try to apply that to a, a, a white male, like all that shit goes out the window, you know, you can, you know, you can sit in class and throw around words like toxic masculinity and mansplaining and all you want. Nobody bats an eye. And little do they know that, you know, every man sitting in that class is just checking out, you know, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, we got to st- stop saying things like, I mean, one of the things in that, that pole dancing documentary that we watched that just f- frustrated me so much is, you know, them talking about like oh we've we've had these traumatic experiences at the hands of of men and it's you know men are responsible for all of our trauma and i would be okay with saying those men right right because it's not men it was those men it was one man in your life Mm -hmm. dreadfully sorry that man should be held accountable that man Mm -hmm. those men not men you know Mm -hmm. um and so until we get until the conversation turns from retribution and vindication mm-hmm. to actual forgiveness, healing, and progress, men are just going to continue to check out. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to motivate a man to grow himself, to want to grow himself, if he doesn't feel like anybody's going to acknowledge it or care. And to add on top of that to imply that his desire for growth is somehow pathological. I mean, it is only going to set us all back farther. We're only just going to create more, you know, hurt damaged men who are going to hurt women and other men. Um, So yeah, we got to stop making it socially acceptable to, to protect everybody else except men. And that brings us back to what you said and just your first thoughts after we read through the essay of just providing a path for redemption mm-hmm. when right now there is none. Mm-hmm. 
but he really clearly outlines here. That's really possible. It's possible. Yeah. It's very possible. Mm -hmm. It's just a change in the narrative. Mm -hmm. It's a change in the culture. Mm -hmm. Calling men in instead Mm of forcing them out. Mm -hmm. I think there's something I see as well is that there's a lot of men who I would say are good men, but have also sort of internalized all of this hatred for men, Mm -hmm. you know? And and to me, it's almost like I can see the apprehension like in their body language when they agree, you know, when they, you know, when they use feminine language of, you know, mansplaining or toxic masculinity, it's like they say it and it's like, I can see in your eyes, you don't believe what you're saying, but you're afraid to say what you you really believe. And maybe it's because you don't really know what, what else there is for you. You know, it feels like there's these men that, it seems like there's these men that f- potentially feel backed into a corner and they've just accepted that they are what the culture has told them they are. You mm-hmm. know, they've internalized that pathological, you know, narrative that's been told about them. Right. You know, and, and, and yeah, I mean, you have young kids growing up hearing that, you know, boys are naturally predators and oppressive and they're growing up thinking that's true and they think it about themselves. And the only thing that's going to do is make them pathological and, and oppressive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we wonder why men commit suicide at mm-hmm. a much higher rate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, let's just let's actually, <clears throat> if we're gonna say we want all voices to be heard, then let's actually hear all voices. And I would encourage anyone who finds themselves being offended at talk of men also having issues to examine why you feel offended at that. And why is it that, you know, on the one hand, you'll agree that all voices should be heard until it's a voice that you don't want to hear, you know, and maybe if that's the case, then maybe you have some self-examination to do, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think there is a collective unconscious for sure um, that has a lot of self-examining to do in our culture. Yeah. What do you think, if we really just let the rubber hit the road here, how do you think maybe your father's life would be different if he would have been surrounded by a community of men the way that he describes in this essay? <clears throat> how do I think my father's life would be different? Well, my father had a, had also an abusive father. Mm. Um, who knows how far that goes back. Um, I mean, that, that's hard to say it's, it's speculation because I, the only answer I know to give is, is just the, the sort of what I would hope that's would okay. have transpired, but I think that's a fine place to start. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I, I guess. Doggo toe beans right here. Um, <laughs> I mean, how would it have been different? I would have wanted him. I hopefully it would have been different in the fact that he would have just been healthier. I mean, he was so bitter and resentful, and he blamed everyone but himself. He took no accountability. Maybe someone would have talked, taught you know, taught him how to take accountability for himself. Mm-hmm. I mean that that's where you have to start. You know, it's like with with addiction, alcoholism. Like you can't. You know, the first step to what sobriety is admitting you're an alcoholic, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Like admitting there's a problem. Yeah. Uh, He never wanted, and still to this day, doesn't acknowledge that there's anything wrong with him, you know? And he lives in a little house somewhere on somebody else's property that, you know, he basically gets to work for them and live there until he dies. But, like, he doesn't have anything or anyone because he's never taken accountability for anything. So... Mm-hmm. To him, he's nothing's wrong with him. So there's nothing wrong. There's nothing to fix. And everybody's left him because they're wrong, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, maybe somebody at some point would have said, hey, you know, maybe you contribute to the, the tribulations of your life. You know, maybe you've done something, you know? Yeah. Maybe you're, you know, being a pathological liar is one of the reasons why your wife left you, you know? <clears throat> 
Um, I, re- I remember very vividly one time, you know, we, we for a moment, I don't know how long, but when I was really young, probably like five or four or five, six ish, even before that, we were living in, um, the same room that's the downstairs where I live now. Um, and that, that other room that's got like all the hunting gear and fishing gear and stuff in it, like that was basically like the living room and the room that has the bed in it, like that was the bedroom. I had a crib in there. Uh, they had a water bed and, um, in the other room in what was the living room, there was a recliner. Uh, <clears throat> and I remember one day sitting like huddled down behind the recliner because my dad was in the bedroom throwing my mom around, you know? And like now, like, it's like, well, first of all, I would have ragdolled him, you know, as an adult, seeing him treat a woman like that, especially my mom. And I wish my papa would have, I mean, maybe he didn't know. I don't know. My mom doesn't even remember this. You know, I've asked her about it and she doesn't even remember it, Mm. but I remember it. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to know, man. It's hard to know. Like maybe he just needed the shit beat out of him one time or something. I don't know. Like it's so hard to know, but nobody ever held him accountable. Obviously, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a huge theme in our, our society right now is we're just so opposed to accountability. We're all so full of shit and so few people are willing to say I'm full of shit, Mm -hmm. you know? I'm full of shit, <laughs> but like, that's how we are. Like we're, we're a fallen being. And so, you know, the first thing, the place you have to start is being like, yeah, I'm full of shit and, uh, I'm broken and I'm a sinner and I make, you know, flawed choices and flawed decisions. And, you know, I have to give myself over to God who created me and ultimately is the only one who can judge my soul and my heart. And other than that, I just have to try to do things to treat the people around me good. Mm -hmm. And he never did that. Right. (laughs) Thank you for sharing all of that. Yeah, no problem. So honestly, (laughs) to strangers. Well, it's just two microphones. (laughs) Yeah, but... I'm Preston. I still appreciate that you can recount your story and sure it elicits a reaction in you, but Mm -hmm. it's one of almost this remorse. You see a different reality that could have been. Mm -hmm. There's a remorse that that didn't get to be the reality that happened. Yeah, but I'm starting it. Exactly. And I think that's, I think that's a, heavy load to bear is when you're the one in the family that says I'm going to break these generational trends and some people would say generational trauma or generational curses or whatever word it is but you're just saying it stops with me well I think my mom started it so I'm Mm going to give her credit Mm -hmm. um but yeah absolutely that's I want to continue that for sure yeah no more weak men in this family Mm mm-hmm because, I mean, ultimately, that's what he was. He was just a, a, a broken man who crumbled under the pressures of life and, you know, yeah, never used any of the stuff that happened to him as an opportunity to get stronger, to do better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you again. Sure. Yeah. You're welcome. I just, I wonder about the solution that Mm -hmm. Charles presents, that if we were to take men like that, and it's hard to think about when you're so intimately connected and it's so intertwined with your own story, but if he would have had a community of men that held him accountable, but I think the beautiful part too is what he points out, acceptance. You can show your unacceptable parts, your hurting parts, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that most people in today's world, they might be lucky if they get one relationship like that in their life, whether that's with a romantic partner or with a parent or a family member that sees them that through and through and loves them that unconditionally. Mm -hmm. 
But I think what he's saying is if we can help create a better world in which men are surrounded by multiple other men that see them that way mm-hmm. with that same like mm-hmm. deep, fierce, unwavering love, mm-hmm. that feels powerful to me. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, I think of my own father and my story is not anything near physical abuse at all. I love my dad and he was doing the best with what he had. And in a similar way, he feels like, you know, just another iteration of his father, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's just what guidance was there? What resources were there? Mm -hmm. One of the most healing things I could do for me and my dad's relationship was to realize in my case, he didn't have any ill intent. Sure. You know, he yeah. was honestly just doing the best with what he was given, and that's mm-hmm. all he knew at the time. And I can't fault him for that because we've all done that because we're all human. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I just wonder what it would look like to have communities where it wasn't because you're related by blood or because I chose to be in a romantic relationship, it was just. I see and care about these people so deeply. I will both at the same time not let them get away with not being the best versions of themselves. And secondly, I'm still going to love them through all of it Mm -hmm. so that they feel like they can be that version of themselves. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking even earlier today about how you miss being in the military and just that camaraderie and the goofiness, Mm -hmm. but just that community of men. Mm -hmm. So imagine taking that, but then yes, you need the lightheartedness. You need the silly and ridiculous and not socially acceptable. You need all of that. (laughs) And you need the break room, right? You need the, (laughs) that don't go on social media. (laughs) (laughs) This is not condoning Donald Trump or locker room talk by any means different thing but I think you also need when those men step up and say dude Mm -hmm. I love you so much you're not doing this Mm -hmm. even just one interaction like that in a man's life I feel like would just be could totally change the trajectory of his life maybe I mean I think that's it's a noble it's a noble thought to have i think it's maybe a little bit of wishful thinking i think ultimately there has to be a desire within the person to want to accept that yeah i think that's the hard part if if a per- if you can get a person there to where they want to accept that even if they don't necessarily believe they're redeemable but they're at least willing to let people try that's that's something but if i mean doesn't he say something here about just unless it's with a psychopath that you have to use force or something with like towards the bottom Mm -hmm. or something. Oh yeah. Right there. Yeah. Who will only listen to the language of force. I mean, that's the issue, you know, my grandfather and my dad, I feel like that's them. Mm -hmm. They'd only listen to force, you know, in that, and in that case, like, are you helping or are you just adding more violence? Right. So I don't know. What do you think about his point here of, self-hatred do you think that is where some of this stems from where does it say that so he's saying for example these two men that were ousted from society for things they did to women do we send them out of town regretful but not remorseful Mm -hmm. bearing even more self-hatred than they had already perhaps to act it out a bit more discreetly in another place yeah i think that was kind of what i was touching on earlier when i i said it it seems to me that potentially there's men who who have internalized this narrative that gets spoken about men and they'll they'll parrot a lot of the talking points and to me it doesn't seem like it's coming from any sort of place of truth or honesty but just like they're capitulating to you know to the the status quo because they don't know what else to say or what else is out there for them or what else they could be And so I don't know if it's necessarily a self-hatred, but it almost feels just like an apathetic sort of surrender to evil. Yeah. To malevolence, you know, like, oh, I don't, there must, you know, this is all I am, I guess, just an oppressive pathological man. And 
I guess I just better, you know, do my best not to hurt anybody. Mm-hmm. And like, that's what I feel from them is this just kind of like, uh, you know, and I mean, I, I don't believe that at all, you know, so. I, How would you describe your experience and your feelings when you're not acting from that place? I don't, well, when I'm not acting from that place. I mean, I, mean, I don't I, think you really ever act from I, that yeah, place. Yeah, I don't, I reject that wholly. Um, I'm just saying, like, <clears throat> contrasting with your experience where you believe different things. So, do you... I believed different things when I was the most hedonistic and self-serving, and which is why I completely reject, you know, the woke ideology and woke values is is because it, it, uh, it refuses personal accountability and it places the blame with with things outside of the person um and so that was when that you know that was when i viewed women as sexual objects and and promiscuity as not virtuous but also not destructive and um you know i didn't believe in any sort of higher power or higher purpose nothing in my life was oriented towards service of others everything was self-service self-serving um and that in itself will make you and I even say I I really don't like to say that will make you a feminine man because I feel like that is an injustice and an insult to femininity I would say that's what makes you a passive weak and dangerous man mm-hmm. that's what that's where the bitter resentful angry man you know man child emerges is in that situation that capacity because that's that's the man child that doesn't feel like he has any agency to affect change in his life or in the world. Mm-hmm. And that's scary. Being in that place. Yes. If, and for how that person can influence the people around them. It feels hopeless Yeah, when you're there. I mean, cause that's the nihilism, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah, it does. I mean, it just, you know, if it, it, it and you know your family gets tired of being around you you don't make any friends really that are positive influences because you know if you're around if you're you're that kind of person and you're i mean i don't i'm not going to hang out with that kind of guy at this point you know if that's who you are like i'll you know i'll try to be a good a positive example and influence on you but ultimately i'm not going to let myself be pulled back down into that Mm -hmm. you know so yeah i think it's that's it's a, it's a dangerous place to be for the person and for the environment around them, the people that are around them. It's it's toxic to everyone around them, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The people around you will lose themselves in in your own, you know, if you have a if you're that kind of guy and you have a girlfriend, she's going to lose herself in that, you know? It's going to tear her down too, you know? If you have children, if you're in that place and you have children, it's, I mean, it's just, it's just evil. It's not good. It's darkness. It doesn't bring life. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no light in it. Yeah. Community, once again, coming back to it. Mm-hmm. What would it be like to have, and I don't even think this applies to just men, but for people mm-hmm. to be surrounded by people that love you so fiercely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's, you know, the analogy that you and I the other day when we were talking about, I mean, this was a couple of weeks ago, somehow cruelness or something. And, and we were like, you know, behaviors get interpreted, interpreted so much differently. Like if I were in a depression, stuck in bed all the time, or you were, you know, you or I would appreciate, if not in the moment, we would at least be able to understand the act of the other of us saying, you know, Get out of the fucking bed. We're going for a run. We're mm-hmm. going to go to the woods and we're going to go for a long run. You know, but there's some people that would be like, fuck that. I don't want that kind of person in my life. You know, they'd rather just lay there and wallow. And so I guess that's that metaphor. That's what we're saying is like, that's what I'm saying is like how, what's the, what's the, the metaphorical long run, you know, mm. to drag these, you know, men children out of their man child ways, you know? I've tried with people at work, you know, I've tried to, Hey man, like, I mean, the buddy at work that I used to hang out with, but not anymore because every time you hang out with him, he just bitches and moans and doesn't want to do anything. And it's just like, dude, this is exhausting. You know, he was always 
for a while was talking about like, man, I just feel like I want something to work for. I need something to do. I need something to work on. Run a race with me, man. Run a half. Spend the next six months like get your body in shape. Like meet a new version of yourself. Show yourself you can do something that you didn't think you could do. Like believe me, man, it's going it's going to change you. It's going to flip your reality. You're going to all of a sudden see things differently. It's going to be undeniable. You're not going to be able to go back to what you were. It doesn't mean you have to become a runner, a trail runner, run races. Just do this one thing. Push yourself so far outside of what you know about yourself that there's it's not a it's not realistic to look back to the old you. And then watch your mind come up with all the ideas of how you might proceed into the future. Oh, I just did that. That to me wasn't used to be impossible, but it's not. What else is possible? Like it changes everything. Mm-hmm. But you can't physically drag those people and make them do it. All you can do is lead them to the water. Put the opportunity there. Come on, man. Please take this. I'm begging you. Like, please, for you, for everyone around you, take this opportunity. And most of the time they don't. So that's the hard part when you're saying, how do we draw these men out? I don't fucking know, man. I don't know. I mean. They have to want to do it. Yeah. And that's where we're in a harder position because we're backpedaling and fixing but man, if we could live in a world where we raise our boys already in a world that exists with support mm-hmm. and accountability and great examples of masculinity everywhere for mm-hmm. them. So then it's not drawing people out. That's the one that's the outlier at that point. Yeah. 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 You know? It's just this self perpetuating cycle of, oh, we have these healthy examples and these healthy role models and we're raising our boys well and they can mm-hmm. thrive in society Mm -hmm. instead of having to fix this massive gap and pull these men out as you say i don't know that we don't experience a fall i mean that's the cycle is rise and fall Mm -hmm. and so maybe what we're saying is maybe what we're the the society the culture we're wanting is on the other side of this fall Mm -hmm. Hmm. and so You know, that's why I feel like there's something in me rising up saying, learn to hunt, you know, learn to grow food, learn to be sufficient in a way that doesn't rely on convenience and societal structure and support, you know? Yeah. Hmm. Do you have anything else you want to talk about? Do you? I feel like we could find maybe a lighter note to end on. <laughs> well, I want to get dressed and look all nice, and we've only got a few minutes before we got to leave. So, okay, I'm not gonna complain about you, you look looking gor- all nice. You look gorgeous, and I'm excited to go do this networking thing with you. Thanks, babe. You're welcome. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, me either. Anything Preston. else, Preston? You sweep. Alrighty. Till next time.